Good evening, and welcome to this special live town hall. Healthy communities, healthy economy, and the purpose of COVID-19 testing and contact tracing. My name is Shana, your moderator on the call. Your Douglas County Commissioners, Roger Partridge, Laura Thomas, and Abe Lydon are live and looking forward to this community conversation. Also joining on the call are Dr. John Douglas and Jennifer Chase from the Tri-County Health Department. Press star three, again, that's star three on your phone's keypad at any time to ask a question. Again, that's star three on your phone's keypad at any time to ask a question. We know everyone has lots of questions, and we will be getting to those very soon. But first, we would like to hear briefly from our commissioners. And Tri-County Health Commissioner Partridge, please get us started. Thank you, Shana. Thank you for moderating what is now our 16th live town hall since COVID about five and a half months ago. So we welcome everyone to the call. Thank you for joining us either on video or on the phone. We appreciate you joining. And we are so thankful that we, the commissioners and our special guests, Dr. Douglas and Jennifer Chase, are able to hear your concerns, hear your questions, and hopefully provide some understanding and answers to what you may uh, like to know. So tonight we are going to focus on the healthy communities, healthy economies, and we will be specifically talking about COVID testing and contact tracing. And if you live in or work in Douglas County, tomorrow you can drive through, walk up, or bike up to a location at the Pace Center. The Pace Center is in Parker. It will be open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this will be a free community testing event. Now, insurance is not necessary, but there are many specifics that you would probably want to check our website. It is the Douglas County website, www.douglas.co.us. And if you look on the left side, you will see testing events. And so I suggest you go there, read a little bit, get a little bit more information. But please remember that's tomorrow at the Pace Center in Parker from 9 a.m. to 1. Now, another exciting thing we'd like to report is to invite you to our will be our 17th town hall next Monday, August 31st at 5.30. And we'd like to share information with you about a small business grant program that the Douglas County Commissioners will be launching later this week. The intention of this program is to reimburse any eligible small local business for a portion of expenses that they've incurred while they've worked uh, to serve our community uh, while complying with the COVID-19 public health order guidelines. So we look forward to speaking with you, hearing you this evening, and I'm gonna now turn it over to Shana or Commissioner Thomas. Hi, Commissioner Thomas, you're live. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us to learn more about testing and contact tracing. So beginning September 1st, there's going to be regularly scheduled opportunities for you all to get diagnostic and antibody testing. The three commissioners agreed to sign a contract. It's a $1.1 million contract with Stride Community Health Center to administer the, con the COVID-19 testing starting September 1st, going through December 20th of 2020. So beginning the week of September 1st, Locations will be available every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at the Douglas County Fairgrounds here in Castle Rock. Every Wednesday in Highlands Ranch at St. Andrew's Church. And on September 14th, every Monday, you can go to the Lone Tree Art Center. We're gonna have another location available soon. So as soon as we have that, that will be posted on our website. There's a lot of information I just gave all of you. So you can always go to the county's website, that's douglas.co.us, and in the search bar, type in testing events, and that will take you to all of the locations that Douglas County is funding for you to get testing done. 
So thank you. Shana, back to you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Commissioner Layden. Thank you so much, Shana. And what an incredible honor to speak with all of you this evening. And we certainly welcome our special guest, Dr. Douglas in Tri-County Health. You know, as we have these ongoing win-win discussions about uh, local governance, in addition to maintaining the viability of Tri-County Health, we're really excited to continue to partner with Tri-County and the phenomenal public health partnership that we've developed over the last five months. Commissioner Thomas spoke briefly about the STRIDE contract, and I'd like to share with you the $1.9 million intergovernmental agreement that we established on July 28, 2020, uh, with Tri-County Health for testing and case investigation through November 30th, 2020. The purpose of tonight's call is to have a more granular discussion about what testing and tracing is going to look like in Douglas County and what that means from a public health perspective. So really looking forward to that discussion with Tri-County. And again, we welcome Dr. Douglas uh, for answering some of your questions this evening. Excellent, thank you so much, commissioners. And now Dr. Douglas, will share the most recent Douglas County COVID-19 public health data. The good news that illustrates the hard work our Douglas County community is doing to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and keep our economy open. And as we get started, we will show two slides for our online viewers. The first illustrates COVID cases by county and the other hospitalizations by county. Dr. Douglas, you're live. Yeah, hi, Shana. Uh, great to be with you all. Really uh, appreciate being with our commissioners uh, and your uh, support of the work we've been doing, both in testing and contact tracing. It's 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 really a timely uh, point in our response to the epidemic to be sure everyone is clear on what's happening and why. So I'm really uh, delighted to be with you. Uh, the slide that you're looking at now, at least I hope you are, uh, is should be entitled COVID case rate. And what, what you see here at the bottom really is where I want you to focus is three uh, uh, curves. These uh, graph lines uh, go back to the beginning of March. Douglas County is the lowest one on here. And that's part of the message here is that Douglas County has throughout the pandemic uh, in our three counties had a uh, uh, the lowest uh, incidence of cases. Um, we went up in April and May, we came down in early June as we begin to do more testing, we begin to see more cases through July. Um, some of that was more testing. Some of that was a real transmission. Uh, the, the red line above that's Rappo and the orange is, is Adams. And we were seeing this sort of trend across Colorado. Um, one of the reasons we believe this really did represent transmission increases and not just testing was that something called the test positivity rate went up. This is something we track on really carefully. As long as that rate is staying below 5%, we believe that we've uh, saturated the necessary testing in the population. Uh, if it begins to get above it, it implies transmissions increasing. We need to do more testing and other prevention work. Um, what you can also see is that that turquoise line began to go down after about July 20th, 23rd, 24th. Um, a number of things happened during that time. The governor uh, uh, reduced bar closing hours. The governor introduced uh, a mask mandate. Um, and frankly, I think maybe people began to see what was happening in other parts of the country and think of, of themselves, let's do what we can to avoid that happening in Colorado. Um, above these lines, I want you to see something called an incidence rate. And I want you to particularly focus on the Douglas County 14-day incidence. Uh, there are two lines here. One says no outbreak, and the one above it says it doesn't say no outbreak. Those are the same number, 46.38. That's how many cases adjusted for the population as the state demographer calculates it per 100,000. And Douglas County is really moving into a much lower territory. Uh, we do like to see the cases adjusted for the population rate because it helps us even it out and we can make more meaningful comparisons between the state, other counties, and this kind of thing. Um, Shana, are you moving the slides to the next one for me? Um, I am actually not moving the slides. I do believe that there uh, there was someone that there are moving the slides. Uh, if we got hospitalizations up, can anybody tell me that? 
Yes, hospitalizations are up, Dr. Douglas. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I'm not well connected. So this is uh, now looking at the number of hospitalizations that have happened in the county, um, going back again to the beginning of March. These are not adjusted for population. These are just pure numbers. And what I want you to see is that in March, we did have a spike in cases in Douglas County. These cases were largely in older folks. On, on this uh, slide, the numbers are pretty small here, but we try to show you the percent of cases by age group. Um, and in Douglas County, for example, uh, historically over time, around 85% of cases have been in people over the age of 45, and a whopping 30% have been in people over 75. So we were seeing uh, cases in older folks. Some of these were people in senior living facilities. Um, some of these were folks that have been traveling. Um, as the numbers went down in Douglas County, the hospitalizations did as well. That was fantastic. And what's really terrific is that they haven't come back up again. So Douglas County, and, and these numbers were, I mean, every hospitalization is one too many. They were never that high. And when the cases went down, they went down. And even though our cases have gone back up, thus far it appears to be largely in younger people. And we aren't seeing the kind of uh, impact that we saw in the springtime. So I take these two data points together to say Douglas County has done well throughout the epidemic. We had some times we went up, but we've come back down. And this, this outcome of hospitalizations has uh, remained gratifyingly low. Now, I'm, I'm a cautious person by nature. I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to continue this trend, but I'm, as the weather gets colder and we can do less outdoors and we begin to see more other respiratory viruses transmitted, I'm going to be looking really carefully at these numbers, um, hoping they don't go up because we've figured out how to live well with COVID. But if they do begin to go up, we'll be working closely with the community and the hospitals to uh, make adjustments as needed. Um, because testing is the theme of the night, I want to make a couple of points about testing. The two data uh, slides I've shown you are all based, of course, on testing in the community. We started out in the springtime not having enough testing available to us, um, and we've definitely improved a lot. The sort of thing Commissioner Partridge talked about with the PACE Center testing is a great example of that. And I do think that in Douglas County, we've, we've moved ahead. Um, testing, as, as Jennifer Chase is going to talk to you about, is really the cornerstone of us understanding what's happening with the epidemic. It's the cornerstone of an individual who happens to be infected to know it so they can take precautions to avoid transmitting it to other people. And it's the cornerstone if they begin to get sicker of seeking early care to try to avoid complications of COVID. We don't have any cures yet. We don't have a vaccine, but we do believe that uh, earlier medical monitoring can be useful in managing a case of COVID. It also serves to trigger what's been referred to, and again, Jennifer's gonna talk about more, is this uh, effort that we're trying to make in contact tracing. And I'm gonna uh, sort of set up the stage that when we get a, a, a positive case, we have the ability to confidentially interview that person, help them figure out how to isolate themselves, and then help them figure out how, who they've been exposed to so those individuals can take precautions. And Douglas County, honestly, is at a low enough place in terms of its case rate that with the capacity that the county has helped us develop, I really think we've got a far greater opportunity to stay on top of it than we certainly did in the springtime. Um, thanks very much, everybody. And thank you so much, Dr. Douglas. Now let's get to some participant questions. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question live today to any of our participants, just press star three. Again, that's star three on your headset, on, on your, your, uh, your phone keypad, and uh, we will get your question right on the air. If you are not in a position to ask your question live today, feel free to send your question to the website at douglas.co.us slash town hall. Again, that's douglas.co.us backslash town hall. And now we are going to go to a live question from uh, Brad in Highlands Brad. Ranch. Brad, you have a question about uh, COVID numbers for Dr. Douglas. Brad, you're live. 
Thank you. Um, number one, thank you everybody for keeping our county safe. We definitely appreciate that here as taxpayers and all the hard work you've done through the county commissioners and through the, uh, the body of government there. Um, my question is, is on April the 23rd, the Governor Polis stated he would separate probable death count. Um, the CDPHE, up until July 4th, had kept those probable death counts separate. There were 344 total probable death cases. Since July 4th, they have added 268 of those back into the CDC provisional death counts. That means it actually went on a death certificate. So they went back. So say, for instance, a uh, uh, Thursday of last week, we had 1,556 confirmed deaths in the state of Colorado, which was located on the CD, CDPHE's website. That afternoon, they added three cases to that, but yet overall they added 15. So there were 12 mysterious deaths that did not line up that they pulled from the probable case count, which I'm wondering why they pulled that totally off the website this morning when they updated the website at the CDPHE. You can no longer see confirmed cases and you can no longer see probable cases. So my, my question to you is, how does that affect Douglas County? And, and do any of the cases land in Douglas County? Because there's no mechanism for us to see where those probable cases come from. And the second question I have is, is Douglas County and the state of Colorado going to separate pneumonia deaths because the CD, CDC and the provisional death count has separated um, 946 of them from the big number, which is about, uh, I think it's about 1824 this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, Brad, thanks for your very detailed question. Uh, you've been studying the data, honestly, probably more closely than I have. I can't really answer your question about the movement of the deaths on the CDPHE website in this recent time frame. I will say a couple of things. Uh, you're, you're, it sounds like you've been paying close attention, so you probably know that um, there are these two ways of defining deaths. One is any death in a person who tests positive for COVID. That's deaths with COVID. And then there's the other one that's probably more biologically relevant uh, of deaths of COVID. The former is one that CDC has asked states to use for consistency. That's the death with COVID. The death of COVID uh, is, is, again, the biologically more relevant one, but it takes a while to sort it out because those death certificates have to be reviewed by the National Center for Health Statistics. And those take anywhere from gee, three, four, five, six weeks to come back. Uh, I, I have seen circumstances where the deaths have changed a little bit. And I think what's going on is some adjudication of that data coming from the National Center for Health Statistics. I can't really address the adding of the three or the subtracting of them that you pointed out, but I will mention the CDPHE launched a new an upgraded version of their website this morning. I just went on this afternoon and I actually haven't been able to find the deaths on there. So I, it's possible they're there and they're just not where you and I are used to seeing them. It's possible something else has happened. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the question of pneumonia, um, historically during the winter months, we do have a category of death that's called influenza and pneumonia. And that's because when we get a, a big flu season it's often difficult when someone dies of a respiratory death to know whether it's due to uh, influenza per se or whether it's due to some other uh, cause of pneumonia, many times in which there's not an etiologic diagnosis. Um, I don't know of any uh, plans to blend COVID counts with pneumonia and influenza counts. So I may have uh, missed the intent of your question, but if it's at that level, uh, I'm quite we're going to keep tracking COVID separately from pneumonia and influenza deaths. Thank you so much. And uh, to our participants on the phone, if you have a question, now's your time. Press star three on your phone's keypad. That's star three on your phone's keypad to get your question asked live to our panelists. And again, if you are not in a position right now to ask a question, live, you can always go to the Douglas County uh, website, and that is douglas.co.us backslash town hall. And again, if you're on the call and you're participating, feel free to go ahead and press star three to ask your question live. 
And we do have a live caller right now. We're going to go to Tyler at uh, Castle, in Castle Rock. Tyler, you're live. Dr. Douglas. Um, I basically just had kind of a generalizing uh, question here. Um, I guess I know it's different for each county, but just curious what our general goal here is and what, what exactly are the goal posts at this point six months into this? Uh, when we first started, the goal, you know, was 15 days to slow the spread, and now we are here six months later, and the data I'm analyzing is just not substantiating for the amount of damage that we've done to our communities and to the children. As back to school is starting, I have friends sending their kindergartners to school on virtual kindergarten, which that's not the point of kindergarten. Um, so I, I'm really at a wit's end here, um, just because, as I said, I, I just was looking at the capital city, Denver, 400 something deaths in a city of 600,000 people, or excuse me, a county of 600,000 people. None of this makes sense, even in Douglas County alone here, in a county of high 300,000 people, we've had 59 deaths since March. So what are, what are the goals? What are we working towards here? Because public health is mitigation. This was a mitigation crisis. I feel like we've mitigated. So what is it going to take? That's my question. So that's really a good question, Tyler. And I, I know it's one that a lot of people are asking. Um, you know, the goal of the entire response to the pandemic is to get us through it and get beyond it. And for that, we, I think, ultimately are going to need a vaccine. In the meantime, your question of why are we doing all this anyway and what are we trying to prevent? We're trying primarily to reduce transmission enough to keep our hospital capacity sufficient take care of folks with COVID and to take other folks. Now we are way below the, the time where that would be a concern, really, certainly in Douglas County, but even in Colorado, which is really good. That's exactly where we wanna be before we start the influenza and pneumonia season, where we always see increases in hospitalizations. But that's really what we're trying to avoid as we develop, ideally, enough immunity through either natural infection, which will be really slow, or through a vaccine to get us through the pandemic. But I want to also pick up on your other very important point, because while preventing ICU surges and overruns was always sort of the North Star, as, as the governor sometimes put it, getting our kids back to school is really critical. I could not agree with you more. I've probably spent half my time as a public health director in the last six to eight weeks working with our school districts on safe ways of their reopening. Um, I will tell you that when we look around the country and see places where schools have opened and then they've had problems, it's in places where there are higher rates of community transmission. And so even when we're not having hospitalizations, as knock on wood, we haven't been seeing many of in Douglas County recently, if we can keep our rates of community transmission low, and, and again, we're, we're in really good shape in Douglas County right now. The chances that our schools are going to be able to safely reopen, and safely reopen means not just kids not transmitting infection to each other, but frankly, more importantly, kids not transmitting infection to the teachers and the staff in the school, because they're going to be at far greater risk of, of serious outcomes from infection than the, the kids will be, even though there can be uh, uh, transmission to children. So to, to tie all that up in a bow, keeping our hospitals able to provide care, anybody with COVID or other illnesses, and being able to keep our communities as open as possible. And I would maybe bold font underline the school, uh, schools being able to open as much as possible. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. And also on the line, we have Jennifer Chase. And uh, Jennifer, uh, we would like to hear a little bit more about the contact tracing, but we also like our participants to feel like they can get involved and, and be a part of this conversation. If you would like to do that, remember, just press star three on your phone's keypad. That's star three to ask your question live. If you're not in a position right now to ask your question live, feel free to go to the website. That site is douglas.co.us backslash town hall. And Jennifer, if you would like to, uh, talk to our participants today about the contact tracing and the PowerPoint slides that they will be reviewing. You're live. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here to talk to you tonight about contact tracing. So I do have some slides to go through. I know that you, those of you on the phone cannot see them, so I will do my best to um, explain the graphics on the slide, and the slides will be available on the website and are available for those um, that are watching live. So, um, so I am an epidemiologist with Tri-County Health Department and currently um, a COVID-19 supervisor for the Investigation Task Force. Um, my activities are solely dedicated to this activity um, during the pandemic. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing to slow the spread of infections using contact tracing. So um, next slide, please. Um, contact tracing is the identification, monitoring, and support of contacts who have been exposed to and possibly infected with the virus, COVID-19. This is a really effective tool for public health to use for breaking the chain of spreading COVID-19 to others. So we, this isn't something new that was developed to respond to COVID-19. We've been using case investigation and contact tracing for decades. Um, to, um, to investigate other infectious diseases. Um, some common ones you, I'm sure, have heard of are um, HIV, other sexually transmitted infections. We use it also for vaccine-preventable diseases like measles and pertussis or whooping cough to do case investigation and contact tracing to um, at least reduce, if not prevent, the chain of transmission. So contact tracing fits into our public health activities um, with, with other very important um, intervention me measures that Dr. Douglas was talking about, like testing and case investigation. So first, we, we need to test people to identify the people in our communities that have COVID-19. Those people that are infected with COVID-19 um, are called, we call cases, and then um, the health department reaches out to them to inform them that they are infectious and the time period that they are infectious for, and to recommend um, stay-at-home measures to make sure um, that they're keeping uh, their friends, family, and community safe from COVID-19 while they can spread it to others. And so during that investigation, we also um, identify contacts who have been around the person who has COVID-19. So there's a specific definition for what's determined to be a close contact. And um, that for COVID-19, that is anyone who has been around the case for 15 minutes or more within six feet. So almost all the time, this will include household contacts and other people the contact or the case has been around while they're infectious. And in gathering that information from the cases, um, then we have the opportunity to reach out to their contacts to one, inform them that they may have been exposed to COVID-19, and then to ask them to stay at home or quarantine for 14 days after that last exposure to the person that has COVID. Um, during that time, we ask them to monitor themselves for symptoms and to contact their healthcare provider and the health department if they develop symptoms. Because in doing that, um, we can help direct them to testing. We can also, um, connect them with supportive services if they need those things to be able to stay home um, during their quarantine period, and then ensure um, that they stay at home if they're infectious with COVID-19. So it's important um, to think about contact tracing kind of as a multiplier of, of COVID-19 infection. So each individual case, um, for example, can infect say, two to three people. And those two to three people then can infect two to three more people, and so on and so on. So if we can break that chain of transmission from cases to their contacts um, and make sure that um, additional subsequent COVID-19 infections are staying home and staying away from others and not infecting others, we can really have a, a big impact on the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. So, so we do. So again, as I mentioned, we do this. Um, as a regular um, regular business um, outside of this um, COVID-19 pandemic. We've been doing it for decades at the health department. And um, usually at Tri-County Health Department, this is something um, we manage with seven epidemiologists in our communicable disease um, program. 
Um, just recently, um, we hired um, 100 additional people in the month of August who have all recently been trained um, to do contact tracing. So we're really trying to improve our efforts and um, do a lot more outreach in this area. Um, in total, we have about 200 people um, responding to um, COVID-19 doing case investigations and contact tracing. Um, see here. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, that was a bit long on that first one. Um, I'll make sure to give plenty of time for questions. So let me just go through a couple more highlights about contact tracing. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is uh, one of several tools that are in our toolbox to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, and these go along with other things, like um, I'm sure that you know about and have been hearing more about um, our community interventions, um, which include our stay-at-home orders from the governor, including um, asking people to telework when possible, um, closure of non-essential services, and other um, public health measures like wearing face coverings, um, washing hands, and staying home while you are sick. So in addition to that, there's our um, testing, uh, case investigation, and contact tracing. Um, that's done at the, at the health department. And then we're also looking at all this data we're collecting just to analyze what is going on with COVID-19 in our communities and reporting that back to you. And some of that information is used in the variance metrics that we're um, using to try to get um, businesses, schools, and other community organizations back open and operating. Um, during case management, um, we also, um, some of the tools we use there, I mentioned, are, are isolation and quarantine. So getting sick people to stay home and getting people that have been exposed also stay home in case they develop the infection. I'm sure as you've been hearing in the news and the public information, people are infectious two days before they even have symptoms. So before they even know that they're sick, um, they're infectious. And the newest um, research that's out shows that that may be one of the most in, um, infective periods in a person's illness. And then of course, in healthcare settings where there are patients with COVID-19, there's um, specific isolation that's taking place in hospital and healthcare settings, specific um, personal protective equipment or PPE like masks and gowns and goggles and things that um, healthcare providers are wearing and other safety measures being taken at the level there. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we find out about your uh, about your test results? So, so anyone that has tested for COVID-19 um, is reported to the health department from the laboratory or the healthcare provider that diagnoses that individual. So this is part, again, of um, regular communicable disease processes that have existed for, for many, many years um, and has now just been added to the list of um, reportable conditions that healthcare providers and laboratories are required to report. So we at Tri-County Health Department are notified by the State Health Department, which has been referred to as CDPHE, um, of a positive test result. So once we find out about that, um, we, uh, as soon as we find out and as soon as we can, it's usually um, with, uh, in less than 24 hours, we reach out to the case um, to interview them and um, get information about their symptoms, make sure that they have the supportive services they need, um, make sure they understand their test results and what that means. And um, then we provide uh, recommendations for isolation or staying at home and what they can do at home care and also to even um, isolate within the home to prevent their household contacts, their family um, from potentially being exposed to them while they're infectious. During that process, again, is getting back to contact tracing is when we collect information about their contacts. And um, then we, um, after the case investigation is completed, reach out to their contacts to do the same thing, to go over, to inform them about their exposure um, and uh, answer any questions they have, connect them with any supportive resources they might need, like food assistance, uh, rental assistance, legal assistance, um, um, mental health and behavioral health services. And um, then we provide testing recommendations also to those folks um, to ensure that they know their status. We have all kinds of other wraparound services too, and I'll let you um, or talk about more than that in the Q&A if you have questions about that. So um, next slide, please. So the information that we collect 
um, it's pretty, we collect, um, of course, basic demographic information. We need to uh, verify your name and address and date of birth to make sure that we're talking to the right person um, and that we know that uh, we're talking to someone in our community. Um, and then we ask symptoms, or we ask questions about your symptoms um, and what you did uh, before you got sick so we can figure out how and where people are being exposed and then um, what you did after you were sick so we can find out um, potentially who has been exposed, which also helps us do things like identify outbreaks and put control measures in place where we need to do that. Um, and then so we asked also questions about when your symptoms started and that helps, um, that helps us to determine the isolation period or how long you need to stay at home. And then we ask questions about your work so we can help understand um, if there have been any workplace exposures or if you're in a high risk profession like working in healthcare or working in a, um, a residential setting like a group home or potentially working in a jail where um, transmission um, can be uh, occur more rapidly. So um, things we will not ask you about, however, I know there's been some information in the news about um, people taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation, unfortunately, um, and trying to make money off these things. So we will never ask you for money. We will never ask you for a credit card number. We will not ask about your social, we will not ask for your social security number. Uh, we will not ask about your uh, legal residency in the United States. We will ask if you are a resident of Trent County, but we will not ask about your um, U.S. citizenship, and we will not ask about your bank account number. And so I know with a lot of this information, it's very personal. It is protected health information, and we take that very seriously. Um, so I wanted to address some privacy concerns. And next slide, please. Um, so just so you know, our team will connect with you over the phone. So all of our information is over the phone, and if we don't reach you on the phone, we may send you an email or a letter if we have that contact information. Everything we talk about on the phone with you is confidential, meaning we um, use the highest security measures we can to protect your information at the health department. And um, we will not share your, your information with others um, um, unless in extenuating circumstances, like if someone is not compliant with uh, isolation or quarantine. Uh, we may need to contact, say, an employer, for example, um, to make sure that that person isn't going to work. Um, and then you're, you are also welcome, especially with what's going on with kind of um, scams and people um, trying to take advantage of the COVID-19 situation, you can um, verify if the caller or the person that's calling you is from Tri-County Health Department. We have over 200 people um, doing this case, and, or nearly 200 people doing this case and contact investigation work. And so you can call our call center to verify someone's identity and mother from the health department by calling 303-220-9200. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, next, um, if, you, if you don't mind, we actually have a question online, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, how, sure. What can I answer okay. for you? Sure. So this question, either for yourself or for the doctor, um, it's from Zane. And the question is, why do healthy students and teachers have to quarantine for 14 days for contact with a positive case? Is this just to pursue contact tracing instead of supporting in-person education? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the 14 days that we ask people to quarantine for is when if someone is exposed, COVID-19, the incubation period or the time it might take someone to develop symptoms of the illness are, is 2 to 14 days. So it can take someone up to 14 days to develop symptoms and to develop the infection. So that is why um, we ask them to stay home for 14 days. And as I mentioned before, you can be infectious two days before you even develop symptoms. So you wouldn't know to isolate um, before you got sick because you wouldn't even know you were sick. So we ask people to stay home that whole 14 days to reduce transmission or prevent transmission. Great, great. Thank you so much. And we actually mm -hmm. have another question for um, Dr. Douglas. Dr. Douglas, uh, we have a question. Actually, this is a live question from Tracy. And again, participants, if you would like to ask your question live tonight, to our distinguished panel, feel free to press star 
three on your phone's keypad. Again, that's star three to ask your question live of our panelists here. And um, we have Tracy, and Tracy is um, from Parker for Dr. Douglas, and uh, she has some questions about some testing sites. And Tracy, you're now live. Um, yeah, so I just had some questions about where to go to get tested in the reliability and validity of the test. Um, because I've been in contact with, with some of my medical providers and they've suggested that you know, certain places are more valid and reliable than others. So I'm just questioning like some of the math sites, are those just as reliable as maybe Children's Hospital or some, some other hospital in the area? So this is a really good question we, because we do now have an increasing uh, array of options to consider. Uh, first of all, Tracy, we try to keep a list on our website of the larger places that uh, you can get testing done. Um, uh, at this point, uh, unless a test is described as being, quote, rapid, uh, and, and, the, and we are seeing an increasing number of places, urgent care clinics, even some pharmacies offering rapid testing, they're all done uh, by PCR testing. That's really considered to be the gold standard. And there's not any evidence that the quality or the accuracy of the test varies by site. Um, there are some uh, facilities that send their tests out of state. For example, the mass testing sites, the Pepsi Center in Aurora, uh, Waterworld in Adams County do use out-of-state testing labs. And there have been times, this got, got to be a problem about a month ago at the Pepsi Center when testing from Arizona, Florida, Texas really scaled up, that there was so much uh, demand on the lab, the test results got delayed. That's a bad thing, uh, but we don't think it was the accuracy. Right now, the test turnaround looks really quite good. Um, I would note that if you do see a place that offers rapid testing, and they're great because you can get the results back fast, you need, and fast means within uh, 45 minutes to an hour usually, you need to be aware that that test does not have the same sensitivity as one of these viral PCR tests. And by sensitivity, I mean, does the test correctly tell you that you're infected if you are infected? And we think these PCR tests probably have a sensitivity of about 98, 99%. So they're really good. And a negative test is pretty definitive that at least as of the time you had the swab, you're not infected. The rapid tests probably perform less well than that. Uh, we, we really haven't determined just how much less well, maybe 75, 80, 85%. Um, so it, a, a positive test is, is real. A negative test may be the test wasn't quite sensitive enough to detect whether you were infected or not. Thank you so much. And again, participants, if you would like to ask your question live of our distinguished panelists tonight, feel free to press star three on your phone's keypad, star three, and that will allow you to ask your question live. If, again, you're not in a position to ask your question live tonight, feel free to go online. And online, you can ask your questions to our website, and that is douglas.co.us backslash town hall. Again, live questions are star three on your keypad. And online questions, douglas.co.us backslash town hall. And speaking of online questions, we actually have a, an online question for Commissioner Thomas, I believe, and it's from Amina. And she said, will Douglas County be assisting local businesses and, uh, in the loss of businesses? Commissioner Thomas, can you answer that question for us, please? Yes, Amina, thank you for that question. So we are getting ready to launch a grant for small businesses. So I would recommend that you watch our website, the Douglas County website, douglas.co.us, because on Thursday there will be an application process available for small businesses who can document losses that they've had. And in fact, we are going to have a town hall next Monday night. That's August 31st at 5.30 p.m. So mark that on your calendar and call in and you'll get even more details on that grant program for small businesses. Thank you for asking that question. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Thomas. So uh, we wanna make sure that the participants that we have here tonight on the phone get to ask their questions live to our distinguished panel. Again, if you'd like to ask your question live, feel free to press 
star three on your phone's keypad. Star three will unmute your phone and allow you to ask your question live of our panelists. We do have several questions here um, that are ready and poised to go. And we have a Kathy in Highlands Ranch. And this, mess, uh, this question is actually for Jennifer. Jennifer, this is Kathy from Highlands Ranch. And she has a question about uh, contact tracing. Jennifer, if you could please talk to Kathy. Hi, Jennifer. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Kathy. Oh, <laughs> hi, Jennifer. Um, my question is specifically about a employee in a bar or a restaurant that has a positive test. Obviously, you can't contact trace. You can contact trace to the business, but you can't, can't contact trace to all the patrons that may have been exposed in that bar or restaurant. Is there some kind of requirement that the business post a sign that says, hey, we've had a positive case. If you were in our establishment between this day and this day, you may have been exposed. I mean, because otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just a dead end. Right. Yeah, that is a great question. Yeah, we have a, a group of folks uh, working with employers where there have been um, exposures like this. So this is also similar to a situation where um, perhaps someone was in a grocery store or, or a large group setting. So, so the answer, of course, is it depends. Um, but so we would look at um, certain things like um, the, the potential for exposure with this particular person, um, what this person did, how long this person was in contact with, with patrons, to see if it was um, important for the business to notify um, their, uh, their patrons. Um, we would, um, you know, do a contact investigation um, with the employer as a partner um, to, to help us kind of figure out what happened when that person in particular was working. So there may be situations where we would want the employer to notify patrons, um, but that I think would depend on the, on the exposure risk um, and the number of people that were potentially exposed and kind of what that setting would look like. Again, that close contact is identified as being around someone for 15 minutes or more within six feet. So we could be potentially be in a bar situation. Um, and I think now we're doing a lot of things at bars and restaurants to help um, mitigate those potential exposures, like keeping tables six feet apart and um, maybe not having the bars open so patrons can just sit there for longer periods of time. Um, so again, it would depend on the situation. And we always um, work with the employer for voluntary compliance for all those things to figure out the best way to approach that situation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. And now we have another online question actually for Dr. Douglas. Dr. Douglas, we have James uh, who submitted a question online. And the question is, should we get a flu shot and when? And again, participants, if you have a question or if you'd like to ask a follow-up question to some of the questions we've heard tonight, feel free to press star three on your keypad and you can ask your question live. But now we're back to the, the online question. Dr. Douglas, can you answer James's question? Yeah, in a nutshell, James, absolutely. Yes, you should get a flu vaccine. They're actually available now. Um, not every provider has them in stock, but uh, many of our pharmacies do. We don't yet know whether we're going to have um, a bad flu season or a not so bad season. And we never, of course, know until the end of the season just how well the vaccine works. But I think this is of any year to get your vaccine early, this is the year. Because I think if, if those of us who get vaccinated uh, 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 have less to worry about in terms of if we get sick, we also have less flu infection to transmit to other people. That means they have less to worry about. And our school teachers have fewer sick kids in the classroom. So it's a, a tremendous idea and you can do it now. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. And we actually have another online question. And this question is for Jennifer. Jennifer, Brendan wants to know who has access to the tracing info and what are you doing to protect citizens' privacy? Jennifer, if you can uh, address Brendan's question, that would be great. Of course. Yeah, so, so 
people that have access to the tracing info are, uh, we say it's on a, a definitely a need to know basis, even within the health department. So the information that we collect during contact tracing is kept in an electronic database and only those people um, that need to have access to those records are granted access. All of those folks go through, um, through HIPAA training and privacy training before they're allowed to access that information. And um, in, in order to protect the, um, the case or the person that has COVID from being identified, we do not share the name or any identifying information about that person with the contact when we reach out to them. So I did not mention that yet, but so when we call the contact, we do not give name, address, or any information other than the last date of exposure that was um, identified by the case to um, then work with that contact. So, um, that, and then the information locally is um, shared with the state health department um, as we do for um, other um, communicable diseases. And that information exchange is very secure. Thank you, thank you so much. And we have another live question. And again, participants, if you have a question that you would like to ask live of our participants, just press star three on your phone's keypad. Again, that's star three on your phone's keypad. And we'll make sure that we will get to you before this call is over. But now we have uh, Katie from Highlands Ranch. And Katie, you have a question for Dr. Douglas. And Dr. Douglas, the question that Katie has, um, it's about the continuation of um, the end game and, and what's going to be happening with the businesses and just getting a little bit more clarification. If you could just uh, address Katie's question, that would be great. Thanks, Doctor. Hi, sure, thank um, you so much for... Oh. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, okay, I was just going to say thank you so much for um, uh, answering all these questions. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on, on kind of the earlier question. You know, just even looking at the Tri-County Health data, I mean, you know, 2.4% of beds are taken up by COVID patients right now. And I think it's been, you know, unfortunately, but it's been a month since we've had a death. It's been weeks since anyone's been admitted to the hospital. It feels like we're on the tail end, and yet now we're we're investing a lot, and we're we're coming up with other plans and, and doing more. Um, and it just seems like now now should be the time where we're focusing on reopening and, you know, removing restrictions from business and schools, um, and and I thought you said earlier maybe the end goal was really a vaccine, and I don't know, I, it just doesn't seem like this this picture all makes sense together. Yeah, Katie, I know this has been confusing, uh, and I probably didn't explain it very well. Um, let me say that Douglas County has, as its numbers have come back down, is getting closer to the uh, um, lowest incidence category that is covered by the governor's. Uh, uh, public health orders called protect our neighbor. And basically, when the county gets into that phase, if it continues to make progress, then uh, the capacity of various uh, businesses, places of worship, gyms, uh, outdoor events, indoor events, et cetera, et cetera, begins to uh, increase more and more. Um, it's not back to February of 2020, uh, but it gets more and more open. Um, and I know, look at the numbers, you go, well, what's the big deal? Nobody's been hospitalized. The hospitals aren't that full. Why are we doing this? And the answer is largely to carefully uh, prevent things from accelerating again. Again, I think Douglas County has really had a very fortunate ride of it. Um, I, would, I, I think the county has responded very effectively. Um, we, for example, I know there's been controversy over people wearing masks. And yet when we monitor what's happening in Douglas County, it's like 96% of people when we go to stores are wearing masks, which I think is terrific. So getting, getting uh, uh, to that low number is going to allow the, the county to open up more um, fully and is going to uh, allow the schools to stay open more fully. That won't need to wait until a vaccine's here if we can keep those transmission rates low. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really informative. And uh, we just got some information about some testing locations. If any uh, participant or any resident of Douglas County, if you're looking to get any kind of COVID testing, 
just wanted to make sure that you are aware that there will be an upcoming testing event tomorrow in Parker. And the website to get more information, times, and, and to get more details is douglas.co.us backslash COVID-19 hyphen testing backslash event. Again, that's douglas.co.us backslash COVID-19 hyphen testing backslash event. And again, we still have a little bit more time. If you would like to ask your question live of our panel, please feel free to press star three on your phone's keypad, star three on your phone's keypad. And if you were not able to get your question asked live today, you can always go to the website. And that website for your questions is douglas.co.us backslash town hall. And also, if you didn't get your question asked live today, you can always go back to douglas.co.us backslash citizen connect. And again, we would like to thank all of our participants for being on this call this evening. Thank you for uh, your thoughtful questions to the participants who, who gave their questions live and for those who participated online as well. Just a final reminder, um, if you didn't get your question answered, Tonight, you can go to douglas.co.us backslash citizen connect to submit your questions there. And before we conclude our live town hall, we'd like to give your Douglas County Commissioners a few moments for final comments. Commissioner Layden, let's hear from you first. Sure. Well, thank you, Shana. And again, thank you to our guests from Tri County Health for providing such insightful information. And I really want to reflect on some of the key salient questions that were offered up by our amazing citizens. You know, we wouldn't be in the great place we are health-wise in Douglas County if it wasn't for our citizens. So our thanks really goes out to each and every one of you for doing the right thing, being responsible, and taking care of yourself and your loved ones. Um, you know, Tyler asked a question early on about what is the end goal? You know, we spent the last five months aggregating data and working on a daily basis uh, with our public health experts to try to identify ways to really get back to normal. I don't think that uh, our perspective is an indefinite uh, quarantine or limitation in your freedoms. I think we wanna get back to normal as soon as possible. And the way to do that is to work together, work upstream and stay positive but I'm looking at the numbers as of today, and we have seven people actively hospitalized with COVID-19 in Douglas County, seven total out of 370,000. When I look at that and also reflect on the 9.9% .9 unemployment rate, you better believe I'm very concerned about the economic impacts and how we can get back to a place where people are employed, kids are back in school, and we're living our lives normally again. So. Thank you to everyone listening tonight. Hang in there, and we'll look forward to the next uh, town hall with you all. Thank you, Shana. And thank you very much. Commissioner Thomas, if you'd like to say uh, a few words. Thank you, Shana. I'm going to reflect on what Commissioner Layton just said about people taking good responsibility and care and decision making. Our numbers are very low in Douglas County, and that's because all of you had made, have made good choices. And I'm just going to quickly add that we've had a lot of people asking us about our businesses and how things are going. And because our businesses were so nimble and our citizens, you supported those businesses, our sales tax revenue in Douglas County is up 7.9% from January through June this year over last. So again, you all, the citizens of Douglas County have made good decisions taking care of yourselves and our businesses. So I'd like to thank all of you and tell you what an honor it is to serve you each and every day. Thank you and God bless. And thank you so much. And lastly, we would like to have Commissioner Partridge. Would you like to give some closing words? You bet. Shana, thank you so much for your moderation. Dr. Douglas and Jennifer, thank you for your expertise and input. I know it's very helpful for a lot of the listening audience, no doubt, and uh, great information all the way around. As, as Commissioner Thomas mentioned, commerce is going on in Douglas County, and that is a great tribute to the residents and the business, businesses because it's getting more and more back to normal as much as possible. 
And that really gives a lot of comfort to a lot of people because uh, it's the resilience of all of you that really make the Douglas County what it is. And, and we really appreciate that. So even though your commissioners were not heavily involved in the question and answers tonight, please know we continue to work very hard a lot with the testing facilities, the processes to provide for that, provide the funding for those through, by using the CARES Act funding. We also are working a lot to provide for the PPE and those who need it. And along with the regular getting back to regular business. So we thank you so much for being involved. Stay tuned. I think next week you'll hear a lot more and I think we're going to have a, a good response to the grant funding that we're looking to and will be proposing for businesses to apply for. So we uh, thank you. Stay healthy. Stay well. God bless. Thank you, Commissioner, so much. And just as a reminder that next Monday, uh, you will, there will be a, a small business grant town hall at 530, and that is on the 31st of uh, the month, the end of the month, uh, the next Monday. And on behalf of our Douglas County and the Tri-County Health Department, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your time with us this evening, and we hope you will join us again for future town halls. Be well, be blessed, and good night. <laughs>